Uh, welcome back. This is the second half of the lecture on uh, an introduction to religious studies part two, Freud, Jung, and Eliade, variations on a theme. Last time we talked about uh, William James, Freud, and Jung. And today, uh, the, the second half here, we're going to talk about uh, Mircea Eliade. I actually don't know how to say that name right. Mircea Eliade, I think. Um, and he's, he's one of the later of these individuals, although he knew Young and was apparently friends with Young, is my understanding at least. Um, and I want to make the, a comment that Eliade's work was really my introduction to comparative religion. This is where I started. Was, um, I read uh, some of the people who were directly influenced by him, and they were giving me his beliefs without, I didn't know where they were coming from. And then someone gave me uh, some of his books, and I read them. And uh, this is what kind of sparked my interest in this. Uh, Eliade's uh, main thrust here is it has to do with reductionism. Um, and he's not the first one to, to start this whole idea of phenomenology. But he is, uh, at least for me, the most influential phenomenologist. Um, there were some people before him. I think Otto is, was the name of one, et cetera. But, Reductionism is the practice of analyzing and describing a complex phenomenon in terms of phenomena that are held to be uh, a simpler or more fundamental level, especially when this is said to provide a sufficient explanation. Uh, so let me give you an example. Um, chemistry it is a complex science where you can make all sorts of complicated molecules and you can describe it in terms of you know, shells and, and uh, electrons binding, etc. And when you describe it that way, it's, it's a good level to do chemistry. But you can reduce chemistry to physics. Because the underlying physics of the atom tell you why atoms bind the way they do, why electron shells work the way they do. So you could make the argument that we could just skip chemistry altogether. We don't need to teach chemistry. We could just teach physics. Because all chemistry is just physics. Well, the problem with that is twofold. One is that. Um, sometimes we reduce things that aren't actually reducible. In, in this case, I think chemistry really is reducible to physics, but sometimes we reduce things to other things that you can't actually reduce them to. But the other problem is even when you can reduce something, uh, complexity <clears throat> is an emergent phenomenon, we know from kind of chaos theory, and sometimes you need to describe things at a higher level in order to make it work well. And it was by describing chemistry at the level of chemistry instead of the level of physics, you can actually simplify uh, and you can, you can do chemistry in a way that is incredibly useful. It was by describing it at a different level, it's useful. Instead of talking at, a, at the base level, you can, you can talk at it about something, a phenomenon at a higher level, and that's useful. So let's assume for a minute that religion is just uh, a psychological phenomenon. Well, I can describe it at its own level in a way that might be really useful for explaining why a specific church chooses to not ordain women to the priesthood. Right? But if you want to just try to reduce everything to a, a religious, a psychological phenomenon, um, it's really hard to go to that higher level and talk about the theology of the religion, etc. And so that's one of the problems with reductionism. The other is, again, we, we reduce things to things that don't work. Like religion is just an emotional, psychological response. Religion is just a neurosis. Religion is just an economic system designed to repress the masses, the opiate of the masses. Each of those are a statement of reductionism. We're reducing religion to something simpler and saying it's just that. And it's not just that. It's a much more complicated um, system that incorporates many things. At least that's the way I would approach avoiding reductionism. It's something that happens at its own level um, because it, it's composed of many different fundamental things that come together and then, you know, emergent complexity ensues like chemistry and it's useful to describe at its own level. Uh, the phenomenologists, however, uh, attempted to avoid reductionism in a different way. They attempted to say that religion describes something real. And in that sense, you're, um, you're, you're in kind of the land of, of believers when you move into phenomenology. Uh, and what they're saying is that religion describes a real phenomenon out in the world. 
And so religious people are religious because there's something out there that they're responding to that's real. And if you treat it, you know, uh, not many people say, Let, let's study math, but math isn't real. And so that's the argument the phenomenologists would make. Let's study religion and assume that religion is real. And it's really something out there that people are reacting to. Now, you, you, you have to, um, in that sense, you're almost moving back to theology. I mean, this is where, remember, I, the, the, in, the, in that first lecture, I talked about moving from theology to apologetics to hermeneutics to religious studies, comparative religion as part of that. And then moving to phenomenology is almost this move back to theology. But they're trying to still study it scientifically. And so what they're saying is, let's assume it's a real phenomenon, and then let's study it scientifically, and, and let's, um, yeah, it, yeah. How similar would you describe this uh, to uh, your own spiritual experience? Because uh, in a lot of ways, it's reminding me of, uh, I mean, what I know about your background, it really is reminding me of you. I don't, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on my own spiritual journey, but, but I don't think I would, I would categorize myself uh, as a phenomenologist exactly. I'm more of an agnostic uh, in that sense. I think it represents some sort of basic um, human, element of human psychology. It's worth studying because it tells me what it means to be human. But whether there is something sacred, real out there is a different question. And so in this sense, what they're doing is they're saying, well, let's assume there's something real out there that we're studying. And, um, and then let's... Um, But let's study it scientifically by looking at the things that we see that all these religions have in common. And in that sense, it departs from theology. So if I'm a Christian doing theology, I speak about things in terms of Christianity because I believe Christianity is true. Or if I'm an apologist, I speak for Christianity or Islam. Say I'm an apologist for Islam. I assume that Islam is true, and so I speak about religion in theological terms related to Islam, or I try to convince people as an apologist that Islam is true. These people said, no, no, let's, um, let's uh, assume that everybody in all these different religious traditions are reacting to something real. And let's study what that is by looking at how they all react. And let's look at how they all react um, in a comparative sense. And so again, here we see a bridge to comparative religion. You see how he's doing this. So Eliade believed that there was something real in the experience of the sacred, almost like space itself and time itself had a different quality in sacred places. And he believed he could feel this. You walk into a sacred space, you feel something, and he says, ah, that's the numinous, that's the sacred. This space is, sa is special. This space is sacred. And then he said, well, I can't really measure that myself. I just feel it when I walk in. But I can look at how people behave when they walk into a sacred space. And I can compare how people in different religious traditions walk, uh, behave when they enter their own sacred space. And by doing so, I can learn, I can study sacred space itself. That makes sense. Now, um, I believe that it's, it's an unfalsifiable sort of position because if it's a psychological phenomenon, say, well, people would behave differently. And if there's a shared psychological underpinning behind it, then we'd all psychologically behave similar ways when we walk into sacred space. So you can't actually falsify or unfalsify his belief that sacred, there is a sacred reality based on the approach he used. But either way, so I, I kind of want to talk about that because that's his, his own personal belief. But I believe once you kind of go past that, you can say, okay, now everything else he did is still useful because he's really noticing. Again, much like Jung, he's noticing similarities. He's finding patterns. And it tells you something about human nature, whether you accept his belief that there is a real phenomenon there or not. So... Uh, what he, 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 he boils this down into at least four things. He said, you can see the sacred or the, or the psychological experience of the sacred or whatever it is um, in the way people react to sacred space, sacred time, the sacred symbols they create, and the myths and rituals and the interplay between the myths and rituals. And like I said, this, this individual was 
my introduction to comparative religion because he did just this amazing job of describing these things and how they worked and compiling examples from all over and it's very useful and interesting things. And he's influenced a large group of people who came after, whether they believe there's a real religious phenomenon or not. So, uh, sacred space. Um, this is the, the, the way we boundary, put boundaries around a place that we consider sacred and how we make it sacred. In other words, if you have a special feeling when you walk into a sacred place, what is it about that place that makes, it, makes you have that feeling? And how do people go about creating that, play, that space? And how do they pick the space? And he noticed things like people pick spaces where they believe something special happened in the past. Almost like something breaks through from the land of the sacred into the profane and then people feel that feeling in that location so they build temples there. Um, or they make a temple in its own place and then they dedicate it. So he said rituals can create the sacred space. So the sacred space is either something that breaks through or you use a ritual to bring it through into the, into the reality. Um, once it comes through, it becomes the center. So he, ha he loved to talk about the sacred center. Uh, and he used, for example, this, is, this wonderful painting is a picture of the world, actually, believe it or not. This is Europe, this is Africa, and this over here is Asia, and this is Jerusalem, right? And the, the people who drew this knew that this is not an accurate representation of the geography of the world. They were trying to represent a sacred geography, um, representing this idea that the place where Christ broke through is the center of the universe, the new spiritual center of the universe. And they were trying to draw this spiritual center. And then, of course, out here you have, you know, dragons and, and deformed individuals drawn all the way around the outside because as you move your way out from, from the sacred center, the land becomes chaotic. The waters themselves represent chaos. And so you're moving from the center out into the world of chaos. And so organization and order come when the sacred breaks through and chaos happens outside of that realm. And the further outside you go, the more chaotic the world becomes. So this is an attempt to draw a spiritual reality rather than a physical one. This is the, the plan of Salt Lake City. It's got the temple in the middle and then you, you order everything, first north, second north, right? You no order all the streets from the temple because the temple is that center point that you orient your lives around, that you orient yourselves around. And this is the, the this is what's the, the influx of the sacred does to you. It gives you this center from which you orient yourself. And it can break through spontaneously or again by ritual. This is the, um, this is the uh, eagle with the snake that, that in the myth decided where Mexico City should be because it was this manifestation of the sacred and so they built the city there. Here we have the temple, uh, the tabernacle of Moses and all the 12 tribes camped around it in, a, in, a, in increasing rings. This is described in, in, the, um, in the Pentateuch in great detail how the, how the camps would orient themselves around the sacred center, which is that temple. And here we have a, a moving sacred center. They could take it with them, but wherever they went, they could reorient themselves because they could reset up this building and it would reestablish the sacrality of the spot. And then they would orient themselves around that spot once it was set up and they could move it. Um, we also have sacred time. This is important because Easter is coming uh, this next Sunday for us. and. We have on the, you know, Christmas is oh, the picture on the bottom left, uh, the birth of Jesus. On the top right, we have the empty tomb of Easter. And so when these sacred events happen, you set up a sacred time, a sacred calendar that then memorializes those events. Just as the temple kind of memorializes a special spot, these events memorialize a special event. And, and so time itself can become sacred for people who, who perceive um, the sacrality of, of, of time this way. Because if you have a, a, a if you, and you have to do things to make it sacred, right? So in um, the Sabbath is the best example of this in Judaism. Uh, the, the list of things you don't do on the Sabbath are the things that make the Sabbath special. So to sacralize a time or a place, you leave certain things out that are unclean and you allow certain things in that are holy and you dedicate it in, with certain actions and rituals. And so this is, um, this is the idea of the space and the time. 
Um, you often memorialize the creation, especially if you're looking for, for something to memorialize. The creation comes up over and over again because the creation is that moment when order was established. And so through ritual and through space and time, you, what's the right way to say this? You, um, you recreate the sacred or you have to recreate the world, or you have to reestablish order from chaos, or you have to make sure that the world doesn't drift away. See, when, when it was created, it was ordered, and then there's this belief that it slowly degenerates, and then you have to recreate it, reorder it. And so the rituals and the temples you build are all designed to, to memorialize that, that creation and thereby reestablish the creative moment. And that's, again, the Sabbath, right? God created the world in seven days and uh, six days, and on the seventh he rested. So we rest every six days to memorialize the creation. Uh, then the other thing he felt like, uh, and this, this reminds me of, of um, Carl Jung. Uh, Jung believed that the archetypes that is in our collective unconscious break out in symbols. Well, Marche Eliade said that... Um, that when we try to find the sacred, we describe it in symbols, we place symbols in these sacred places, and we ascribe sacrality to the symbols themselves. So here we have a, a totem from, a, from a, um, an, an Australian tribe. People have crosses. There's the mandala. But these physical objects are endowed with sacrality. And the way I like to explain this, uh, and I think some of you have heard me use this analogy. I use it all the time, but I can't, I can't think of how else to do this. It just it works so well. This analogy is the one that made me go, aha, I understand. Uh, someone uh, takes a, a, a pen and passes it around the audience and says, this pen belonged to Albert Einstein. And from, with this pen, we don't know, but maybe, can you imagine, maybe this is the pen he used to, when he wrote the famous equation e equals mc. So can you feel it? And you pass that pen around, and you all feel that kind of sense of, ooh, this was Einstein's, you know. And it was from this great collector who, who loaned it to us from a museum, and we're going to pass it around our audience, right? And then you say, I have another friend who collects murder memorabilia, and this hoodie belonged to the Unabomber. And you pass the hoodie around, and you say, touch it, feel it. How do you feel? And people won't even want to touch it, right? It's contaminated. That is the, the way we endow objects with sacrality or the opposite thereof. You see that in the psychological uh, um, response to the object. The pen is sacred. The hoodie is profane. And so we endow symbols with sacrality, and sometimes they're sacred because they're a symbol. This is why the cross, you know, if you're in mythology, the cross can ward off vampires because the fact that it itself is a symbol of, the, of Jesus grants it that power that then wards off evil. Uh, he also noticed that myths and rituals mirror each other, that you can't explain myths without rituals, and you can't, sorry, you can't explain rituals without myths, and myths... Uh, are there in support of various rituals. So let me give you an example. This is, um, this is Sinai in the Exodus story of, of uh, the second book of the Bible. And here we have the altar where they offered sacrifice, the rock Moses struck with the rod. Uh, further up the mountain is the burning bush. And at the top is this um, cloud. Uh, veil and Moses passes through the cloud and, and up there is the throne of God where God touches the stones and writes them with his finger. So then Moses comes down the mountain and builds a temple, a tabernacle, and at the, at the, um, at the bottom, he, at the out, outer edge of the temple, he has an altar. Uh, further in, he has a basin of water. Uh, further up, he has a menorah, which is a burning tr bush. It's a tree-shaped object with, that is a candle with burning uh, things. And there's the veil of the temple, which is the smoke. In front of it is the altar of incense, which explicitly says its purpose is to take the cloud with them. When you burn the incense, it, it produces a cloud before the throne of God. Uh, and it says it's so that it can duplicate the cloud um, before the ark, or before the, that, that was there on Mount Sinai. So this cloud veil is duplicated with this altar of incense. And at the very back is the Ark of the Covenant, which we're told represents the throne of God. And inside of it is the two tablets of stone that, that God wrote on his finger, with his finger on the other side of the cloud veil where Moses was, saw God face to face, etc. So 
the rituals that are performed in this temple and the temple architecture itself are an attempt to take Sinai with them as they travel. The myth of the Exodus and Sinai informs the meaning of the architecture of the temple, and the temple is built to inform the myth, and the myth is told to explain the temple. And so then you can start asking questions like, which came first? And it's very difficult to tell. And in fact, they probably came in pieces, each informing the other, right? But you can see that this way that myth and ritual are intertwined. Another good example is the Eucharist. Again, you recreate the sacred moment of the Last Supper. So there was a special event, you memorialize it in time, you recreate it, and it becomes a sacred event, and therefore a sacred ritual. So rituals call in the sacred. They sacralize space, they sacralize time, they, they um, point back to certain myths, and you bring that mythical time forward into the now, and you get to experience that myth uh, kind of personally, face to face. Uh, another fun example is Ezekiel's chariot. I probably should have put this one back with the temple, but Ezekiel's chariot is this dream. You remember Ezekiel has this dream of this chariot with wheels within wheels and cherubim, etc. The chariot actually has all sorts of archetypes and images borrowed from the temple. So again, here we have rituals connected to this myth of, of Ezekiel's vision that are connected back to the rituals that are connected back to the myths. So uh, Eliade is worth reading. Like, I don't want to turn, in, some of you who don't believe in, in anything, um, uh, you know, don't believe that sacred space is real, that there really is something sacred about certain times and certain places that break through. I don't want that to, to, um, to turn you off from reading Eliade, right? Because that was kind of his goal, was to avoid reductionism by assuming that we're studying something real. But, that is a very minor kind of element in, in what you read from him because mostly what he's doing is he's just cataloging and studying how people react to what they experience as sacred. And so his research is really good and his, his insights are incredible and he's well worth reading. Um, and so this, this one is, is probably one of my favorite. This is what I recommend, The Myth of the Eternal uh, Return. Um, by Merce Eliade. Uh, it was, again, it was kind of my introduction to comparative religion. It's what made me so interested in it and kind of excited about it. Um, and it was all about this sacred time, sacred space stuff. And you'll notice that, that I tend to talk a lot about that when I talk about comparative religion from the beginning. And it's, it's where it's, cause it's coming from this source. Go ahead. No. I don't believe so, but he knew Carl Jung. I don't, but I don't think he was psych psychologist at all. He was he was of the belief that religion needed to be. He was a he was a religious studies person, I believe, who was of the belief that we needed to study religion as its own phenomenon at its own level, uh, instead of trying to do be reductionist about it, which I agree with. Uh, but he did that by saying, well, I believe. That what if the sacred is? What if at least the sacred is a real thing that people are experiencing, and let's study how they experience it. Uh, and he, he avoids theology by being comparative about it. He's not taking the side of any one religion and saying this is true, this is not. He's saying everybody experiences the sacred in all the religions and how do they do it and what is in common. And as such, he's really the, the, he's really the beginning of, not the beginning, but, but he's kind of the epitome of comparative religion from my perspective, right? Because he's doing what I want to do with comparative religion, which is try to figure out what all these things have in common and what that tells us about human nature, et cetera. Again, the downside and the danger here is this, is this idea to see patterns where they don't exist. And Eliade is guilty of that too. Right? And this happens whenever you kind of study lots of different groups. You tend to see patterns all over and, and you think you see things that are similar. And that was the problem Jung had and that's the problem Freud has when he interprets your dreams too. And it's the problem that Eliade has. But, but he really did some of the best early work. There's much, there's, there's, you know, there's later stuff that's come after that's built on him and, and we've corrected errors and some of the um, ethnographic studies he used turned out not to be very accurate and things like that. But, but especially for his time, he was, he was I, I believe, he was influential at least and he was very, um, uh, 
productive. I think it was helpful to look at the world this way. Um, you can see his influence and the influence of Jung. So, so from Freud, from, from, from William James to Freud to Jung to, uh, to Michelle Eliade, these people set a stage that we can see in, in popular works today. So I'm going to just talk about popular kind of writings because uh, Karen Armstrong and Houston Smith's books, uh, they tend to talk about the perennial philosophy. You know, they, they see all, these are the all religion are one people. And they are highly influenced by these, these comparative studies of religion, or these, stu these scholars like Jung and, and Eliade. Um, it's also clearly visible in Joseph Campbell's work, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, um, who did the same sort of comparative work with myth. And you know, just as Jung saw archetypes, he saw um, patterns in the hero's tale. And of course, that would then influence Star Wars and all sorts of uh, George Lucas and all sorts of other things. Um, and, but these are kind of the, the, the popular books on religion that you'll find that are just very, very influenced by the people I've discussed. Um, probably the most uh, obvious one, or the most powerfully influenced is this one. This is a Thanes and Hudson uh, publication um, called The Temple um, by a man named Lundquist who is, uh, his, his dissertation actually is also interesting and worth reading, but he, um, he says, let's find um, patterns in what people build when they build temples and what they do when they go to temples and how the temple then influences uh, society. And he's the author of the temple typology. And my original class at BYU was um, called Temples and Texts and it was a study in that typology. And most of that topological approach is borrowed straight out of Marcelliati. And so that is the, the influence of that, which influenced the class, which influenced what I was teaching long, long ago. Um, but Lundquist is worth reading too, but it's, it's very much a, an offshoot of Eliade's work. Um, so which, which of course brings us to the, to the downside, which is this Freud football and the dancing virgins. Uh, let me see, I'm gonna look at the clock quickly. <laughs> Why not? Well, so uh, I will I will put a link to this in the in the video description um, because I don't want to uh, read all of it. It would take too long. But um, this is a, a an article from the Reader's Digest called "Freud Football and the Marching Virgins: All His Rights on the Gridline," and uh, it's a it's a it's a very humorous. Uh, and I've mentioned this before, and I've in encouraged people to read this before. But if you haven't, it's only two pages. Um, you know, I, I, well, I was going to just read the whole thing to you, but it's a little too long. Um, go read this. Uh, when I post this video to YouTube, go, I'll put the, the link to it in the description. And you really should read this article because it is one of the funniest things you'll ever see. And now that you've heard the stories of Freud and Jung and Marcia Eliade, you're in a position to really appreciate this. Um, because what the author does is um, he, 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 he interprets a football game as a religious rite, uh, using the, the, the patterns and the, the approaches of Freud, Jung, and Eliade. And you know, uh, this is what I mean by overfit. You see patterns where they don't exist. Well, he's doing it on purpose, but it illustrates the problem with the approach and, and at least what you need to be careful of. If you're gonna follow this approach to religion and comparative religion, these are the things you need to watch out for because you can do it on accident. He's doing it on purpose, and it's the funniest thing you'll ever read. So I might try to find a couple bits. Let me, let me just jump into it randomly and see if I find a good place. Uh, at the end of the second quarter, implying the summer solstice, the, the processions of the musicians and semi-nude virgins are resumed. After forming themselves into pictograms representing alphabetical and uh, animal fetishes, the virgins perform a most curious rite um, it's small, I'm trying to, requiring far more dexterity than the earlier phallic maypole rituals from which it seems to be derived. Each of the virgins uh, causes a wand of stunning, of shining metal, which she spins on her fingertips, tosses playfully into the air, and with which she interweaves her body in uh, in the most intricate gyrations. The virgins perform another important function 
throughout the entire service. This concerns the mystical rites of um, conversion following uh, success of one of the young princes in carrying the oval across the last white line of winter. As the moment of conversion approaches, the virgins kneel at the edge of the grass, bury their faces on the earth, and then raise their arms to heaven in supplication. So you, you, get a, you get a picture of what this is about. This is great. You've got to read the rest of it because I, I, I don't do it justice by reading just a small part. But this is one of the funniest things you'll ever read, especially if you're familiar with this material. So, um, One other additional resource, um, because I think we're probably going to be done with uh, religious studies. It's too bad that we could have a whole course on religious studies, but we're going to go back to comparative religion, I think. So we'll probably jump into Buddhism next. Um, But if you want to learn about religious studies as a discipline and the history of religious studies as a discipline, this is the best um, resource I've seen in in terms of both its brevity and its breadth and and kind of what it covers. So, you know, it's it's only, you know, something like 20 lectures of a half hour each. Uh, If you you get something like this, you can listen to it on the way to work in in a month. You'll have gone through it. And he's got one half-hour lecture on Freud, one half-hour lecture on Jung, one half-hour lecture on uh, Michel Liotti, uh, another one on William James, and he's got Otto in there, and he's got uh, you know, some of these other great uh, minds of comparative religion from, from, uh, from you know, the, its earliest inception on down, and it's very much worth reading, or worth listening to. Uh, so it's the Great Courses Lecture, an Introduction to the Study of Religion by Charles B. Jones, from the Great Courses. So... Again, I, I, I recommend that resource if you want to learn more. Uh, and I also freely admit that I, I took a lot of my material for this last two classes from this, uh, from this source. It was very useful for me putting all this together. So I'm, thank you for coming. I'll see you next month, and we'll talk about Buddhism. Thanks for coming.